We continue to follow developing news out of the Middle East. Hamas now saying that it has informed mediators that it will stick to its original plan of a, quote, comprehensive ceasefire, which includes the withdrawal of Israeli troops from Gaza, a return of displaced Palestinians, and a, quote, real exchange of prisoners. The information coming from the Jerusalem Post and released just moments ago. I do want to bring in Carolyn Glick, a former policy advisor for Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu and host of the Carolyn Glick Show at Jewish News Syndicate, as well as senior editor there. Thank you so much for taking the time to uh, be here with us today. My pleasure. All right, well, first off, can you break down for me your thoughts overall on the latest developments here? Well, I think that Hamas's statement that uh, they're not going to make a deal with uh, Israel to release 40 of the 130 hostages that they're holding in exchange for 700 Palestinian terrorists who are being held in Israel's prisons, 100 of whom are serving life sentences for murder. Uh, I think that speaks very well to the emboldenment that they feel uh, on the heels of the passage of the UN Security Council resolution with U.S. abstention yesterday, because that that Security Council resolution did not make a ceasefire contingent on them releasing hostages. So right now, all, all it says is give Hamas what they want, a ceasefire, and uh, you get nothing. And we're abandoning the goal of releasing the hostages that were illegally seized from Israeli territory by Hamas terrorists in the midst of an invasion of Israel. So I think I think that's, that they, they read the resolution. They saw that... Uh, you know, the, the United States is not standing with Israel and has essentially abdicated moral leadership at the UN Security Council by by enabling them to maintain their war and maintain our, our, our civilians and our soldiers in captivity illegally for as long as they wish. And a question for you, is the U.S. abstaining any different than if the U.S. had actually voted in favor of that resolution? Uh, not, not, uh, you know, not, not in the sense that uh, it it makes any difference on the ground. No, because everybody knows that the United States, if they abstain from an anti-Israel resolution, and this was perniciously anti-Israel, um, then they're in, they're enabling it to go forward. The uh, the card that the United States has to play at the at the UN Security Council is its veto, and if it doesn't use it, it's effectively supporting whatever it is that it isn't vetoing because it can block anything that it wants to with its veto. Does a UN resolution really matter overall when you think about it? Does it play any sort of role? Because it sounds as though Netanyahu has said that regardless of what the UN decides, the war against Hamas is going to continue. Yeah, I mean, it has to continue. And it's not just Netanyahu who says this. The people of Israel overwhelmingly say this because, you know, one of the things that seems to have, have uh, escape the attention of the Biden administration is that this isn't a counterterrorism operation that Israel is uh, conducting in Gaza. I had Colonel John Spencer, the head of the Urban Warfare Department at West Point on my podcast a couple of weeks ago, and he pointed out that this is a conventional war and that the, the parallels to it aren't uh, counterterrorism operations that were carried out here or there or anywhere. Hamas invaded Israel with an army of 30,000. That's, you know, the, the size of their army on October 7th, they have the strongest defensive positions any military has had ever. They have 400 miles of underground tunnels that they're dug into. Nobody has ever faced an enemy of this kind. And the battles that Israel has fought to date, largely in Gaza, have been conventional battles again between militaries. And yet the United States is acting as though this is something that Israel can just do or not do, depending on what it wants. And that the concern over U.S. support is going to override Israel's requirement to win. But this is, you know, we saw on October 7th what our enemies want. They committed a, a one-day genocide in, in southern Israel. And we can't allow that to happen again. Uh, it, uh, Gaza is just one of the arms of Iran's uh, uh, anti-Israel regional force that it's built that surrounds Israel on all sides. In the north, we have Hezbollah, which has an even more powerful military than Hamas's military in Gaza. And it's watching and waiting to see whether we go forward and defeat Hamas and eradicate it as a military organization and as a regime when they decide whether they want to try to invade us from the north. And so, you know, this has repercussions that are not just limited to Gaza. They're all over the region. Iran has proxies operating in Syria and Iraq. 
They're threatening the Jordanian regime. They're threatening Israel from Jordan. They're also operating inside of Jordan and threatening to invade Israel from the east. And, you know, so when we're looking at this kind of a regional threat environment, which is which is conventional, we add to that, of course, Iran's nuclear weapons program, which they're on the verge of completing, then we understand that what happens in, in Gaza doesn't stay in Gaza. Its repercussions are going to be felt region wide. And that's why Israel, you know, we, we want to go forward with American support. We believe that we know we're convinced that it's in America's national security interest to stand with us as we defeat our common foes. But uh, we also understand that with or without American assistance, we have to. So yes, the Security Council resolution was a deeply hostile act that uh, was carried out against Israel at a time of existential crisis by the United States by enabling it to go forward. But it can't affect Israel's determination to fight this war because we don't have any choice other than to win it, and that's why we will win it. Any surprise that Netanyahu chose to essentially stop the delegation, so to speak, of uh, Israeli officials from going to Washington, D.C. after this uh, refusal to veto that U.N. Security Council resolution? No, I mean, what would be the point? The point of sending the delegation of our strategic affairs minister, Ron Dermer, and our national security advisor, Tzachi Anegmi, to Washington was to explain to the United States why it's imperative that we go forward under the understanding that the United States was open to persuasion and that it was standing with Israel. But after what the United States did at the Security Council, it appears that there was nobody to talk to in the first place. So, you know, it's just it's just wasted breath if the United States isn't going to listen to us. And why should we plead our case before them? House Speaker Mike Johnson had invited Netanyahu to address Congress. Is that something that, in your opinion, could still happen? Was it ever likely to happen in the first place? I think it's very important that the United States, that the people of the United States are become more aware of what the stakes are, what it is that Israel is fighting, and why this is a war that Israel has to fight to, to victory uh, at all costs. And uh, so I think it's it's important for the prime minister to make our case to the American people. He started doing that in recent weeks in several interviews that he gave to the U.S. Mil- uh, media. And I think that's important. And also briefing that briefings that he's given to Republican and Democratic lawmakers uh, in both houses. I think those are very important things that Israel has done. Um, whether or not it, that that uh, that effort to make clear what the stakes are, I believe for the free world and for the United States as well, And whether the right venue to do that extends to uh, another speech before the uh, joint houses of Congress is a decision that the prime minister is going to have to make. Obviously, there are pros and cons to this as to any other question. Um, But I think that it's very important for Americans to understand that when Israel defeats its foes, it's also defeating America's foes, that Hamas, while it's a genocidal organization that represents the collective will of the majority of Palestinians, it doesn't act only on its own. It's part of a larger axis of evil that's led by Iran. And all of the members of this axis of evil view the United States, not because of its support for Israel, but because of what it is and what it represents to the peoples of the world as its number one enemy. So that when we take action against any of Iran's proxy forces or Iran itself, we're acting on behalf not only of our survival and security, but also on behalf of the security uh, of the United States of America. And I think that those are points that the American people uh, have always known viscerally, which is why over 80 percent of Americans told uh, Harvard Harris pollsters just uh, uh, several weeks ago that they support Israel. And only 18 percent of Americans said that they support Hamas. So I think that there is overwhelming support among Americans. But I think that, you know, there's been a lot of disinformation that's been propagated in the U.S. and other media, and it's very important for uh, Israel to make its case clear to the American people so that they also understand what the stakes are here. And a two-part question for you here. When we talk about that Rafa operation, the offensive, is it imminent? Do we know when it's going to start? And also, what is the importance for Israel of conducting this operation in Rafa? And I'm not privy to uh, the uh, the timetables that the military has put forward in terms of carrying out the operation, but uh, yes, it's uh, it's uh, being planned. The government uh, already approved the plans. That's what the prime minister said, I think, a week and a half ago. And it's just a matter of getting the logistics on the ground to enable the evacuation of the civilians from Rafa to uh, 
uh, humanitarian corridor that Israel is setting up for them. So, I mean, all the plans, plans have been laid. And by the way, all of the concerns that the Biden administration continues to voice about the civilians located in Rafah have already been dealt with in the planning process. So I think it's just a question of getting all of the logistics geared up so that people will be able to evacuate and will be able to place them in outside of harm's way. This, of course, we have to bear in mind that the reason that they're still in harm's way is because Egypt, uh, with the agreement of the United States, has sealed the borders so that Gazans, like unlike any other people on the face of the planet, when faced with uh, living in a war zone, are prohibited from evacuating the war zone to third countries, although a number of third countries have already expressed a willingness to take refugees from Gaza for the duration of the war. Um, the United States has been blocking that from happening, but Israel is making provisions for them. So I think it's just a question of logistics and why is this important? It's important because, again, this is a military that we're fighting. It's an army that we're fighting. They use terrorist tactics, but they are an army. And they have four remaining battalions that are still locked and loaded in Rafa, and they have to be eradicated. And they also control the international border with Egypt through Rafa, and that has to end. If we want in the long term to protect Israel from another October 7th emanating from Gaza, then the Gazans cannot be in charge of an international border. And that's why we have to go into Rafa. I mean, the, the tactical and the strategic uh, requirements are self-evident to the people of Israel, which is why upwards of three three quarters of Israelis support the operation in Rafah. And, uh, and uh, it's just a question of lining up our ducks and getting everything ready logistically to carry out this mission. And I'll just add one last thing. You have to understand that what Israel is doing in Gaza has never been undertaken by any military force in the history of warfare. Um, we, we've done things that we didn't think that we were going to be able to do at the outset of the war, which is that we've learned how to fight in tunnels. No military in history has ever fought in tunnels, and we're doing it successfully. We have the lowest ca civilian to terrorist casualty rates, civilian to militant casualty rates in the ratio in the history of warfare. It's only 1.3 to 1 civilians to, uh, to uh, military personnel or terrorists in this case. Uh, the United States didn't approach a ratio that low. Nobody has. This is the most extraordinary, remarkable war that has ever been fought, the war that our men and women are fighting in Gaza today against Hamas. And uh, I have absolute confidence, as do the people of Israel as a whole, in our military's ability to carry this out with minimal civilian casualties and with maximum uh, military victory. All right, Carolyn Glick, thank you so much for taking the time to join us and help break down the latest headlines and information there on the ongoing war in the Middle East. Anything else you want to add about any of this before I let you go? Um, I just think that it's very important that uh, the American people know that um, you know Israel is is pursuing its own interests. And I just want to underline this again. We cannot walk away from this war without complete victory. It has to be a victory that everybody, just as at the end of World War II, there you could have dropped down at any point on planet Earth and everybody would have known that it was the United States that won and Germany that lost. That's the kind of victory that Israel needs right now in order to secure our future. And that's why it's so important that we don't walk away, because the stakes here, as we saw on October 7th, are our lives. Not it's it's the it's the future of our of our country, it's our ability to survive in an increasingly hostile environment, and it's our ability to protect our children and women and and men and elderly. All of that, all of that uh, was shown to be imperiled on October 7th. And that's something that will never happen again. And it will never happen again because we will win this war. And when we do, everybody in the region and the world is gonna be better off. All right, Carolyn Glick, thank you again for taking the time to be here with us today. We appreciate it. Thank you.